Uh, is this guy trolling me? Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Ritual and we will be reviewing health and wellness creator Flav City, AKA Bobby Parrish. But first let me tell you about my sponsor, Ritual. So first of all, you guys know I'm not pregnant anymore, but I am exclusively breastfeeding and that takes a lot out of me, literally and figuratively. So I actually still take my daily prenatal vitamin from Ritual every night before bed as part of my overall bedtime routine. Now, I know the supplement world is really overwhelming, but I like Ritual's prenatal because First of all, it's third party tested and it has 12 high quality nutrients like methylated fourth generation folate, vegan B12, D3 and omega-3. Ritual is also all about focusing their multivitamins on the nutrients you actually need and they're really transparent about where they source their nutrients from and why, as well as their environmental impact. So for example, they use 100% recycled materials in their packaging and their mailers are made from recycled newsprint and plant fibers. Their multi is also vegan, gluten-free, and allergen-free with no colorants, added sugar, additives, or enlisted ingredients. They also have a regular multivitamin for men and women, as well as their 50 plus option. But it's super convenient because they just deliver it to your door as part of the subscription. So even when I'm having super mom brain, I won't run out. So if you wanna try it out, you can use my promo code and check out the link in the description to get 10% off of your first three months of Ritual. You can also pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. I will be talking about macros and calories, so of course feel free to skip that portion if it's not supportive to your journey. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on an episode. All right, very quickly, for those who don't know, Bobby Parrish is a 43-year-old chef and cookbook author whose content is heavily focused on holistic nutrition and food advice. So naturally, you guys requested this one a lot. There's a lot of content on his channel that I would love to discuss. Honestly, I could probably make a whole sub channel just reviewing his approach to wellness. But today we'll be looking at his most recent What I Eat In A Day video at the time of filming, and I'll be discussing some of the general themes that I took away from watching his videos. Let's take a look. So first she's griddling some of that keto toast I love in some Thrive Market ghee, which is a great price for the grass-fed organic ghee in the ceramic pan. We don't use any Teflon in the house. Okay, so first of all, I just wanna intercept here. I actually have a whole blog post on nonstick options, which I'm gonna link below. But to quickly summarize the research, some nonstick cookware is traditionally coated with a compound called polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE, which is more commonly known as Teflon. So this is basically what makes nonstick cookware non-reactive and nonstick. Now, PFOA is another compound traditionally used in the manufacturing process of Teflon, and it is a known carcinogen linked to kidney and testicular cancer. We also know that there is some risk of something called Teflon flu, which is when inhalation of pyrolysis products causes chills, headaches, and fever, etc. which sounds really scary, yes, but, because the majority of the PFOAs gets burnt off during the manufacturing process, Teflon products are not known to be a significant source of PFOA exposure or any of the adverse outcomes associated with PFOAs. Also, we don't often see adverse effects like Teflon flu unless Teflon is heated to 500 to 660 degrees Fahrenheit, which hopefully most people aren't doing. More importantly, nonstick cookware has been PFOA free since 2013. So as long as you've updated your pans since then and you're not overheating them, there's little need for concern. And if you are still using old pans, you can reduce the risk of these side effects by cooking on low to medium heat instead of like a really high heat. Avoid heating an empty pan. So making sure you add a thin layer of oil to protect it and of course, using air ventilation while you're cooking. 
my uh, probiotic. You're supposed to take this on an empty stomach. I've been taking this for a couple months and Seed makes an amazing probiotic. So Bobby uses Seed probiotic, which is a combination of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, which he suggests he takes on an empty stomach. Now I actually have a whole blog post on the best time to take different types of probiotics, which again, I'm going to link to below. But Bobby does actually have the right routine here. So research suggests that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium strains do work best when taken 30 minutes before eating. And ideally that meal has some fat. Even having a 1% fat content in the meal seems to protect the bacteria as the probiotic approaches the intestines. But actually all strains have different preferred conditions. So a probiotic that is Saccharomyces boulardii dominant, for example, doesn't seem to be affected by the timing of the meal. It's organic jasmine loose leaf tea, just boiled water, not boiling water. And you pour it in and then set a timer for three minutes to steep. Loose leaf is always superior to the stuff in the bags. Just make sure when you get tea, it's organic. The tea farming business, especially in Asia, can be really dirty and they can use pesticides that we don't allow here. So organic is a must. I always put a scoop of collagen in my tea in the morning. You gotta get grass fed. This is one of my favorites. But this is also good for your hair, your skin, your teeth, your gut, and your immune system. Okay, lots to unpack here. First of all, there seems to be a lot of intense moralizing around ingredients and ingredient quality. I'm hearing a lot of statements like, you must choose your organic, or this ingredient is dirty, this way or this food is better, etc. Holy f Could he make something as simple as a cup of tea more terrifying? But anyways, here's what we know about toxins in tea. Now it's not uncommon for tea to be contaminated with lead and aluminum since there are heavy metals found in soil and tea comes from plants and plants are grown in soil, period. Now, because of that, we know that the older the tea leaves, the greater the heavy metal load. Now the good news is that research suggests that most contaminants found in tea infusions are not detected at all, or are detected at a much lower level than any of the regulatory standards. But this of course does depend on steeping. So one study found that when steeped for a normal two to three minutes, like what Bobby does, all the teas tested well below the established American toxic levels for lead and aluminum. And while steeping for 15 minutes did increase the levels, they were still largely below the levels of concern. As for organics, they may be better, but they also may be worse. In that study I cited, organic oolong had 40% lower lead than standard, but organic green teas had more than 30% more than the standard. Why? We don't know. So while Bobby may make this out to be super scary, it's really important to consider the toxic cumulative burden of your whole diet. In other words, focusing less on that cup of tea and more on the greater dietary pattern. And that is why, again, a varied diet is so key. As for the collagen, I don't know, people are obsessed with collagen these days, likely because of the claims that it can help to improve your hair, nails, skin, etc. But is there anything magical about collagen for your beauty routine? No, probably not. So in short, collagen is a protein, and like all proteins, it must be broken down by enzymes called proteases in the small intestine in order to be absorbed by the body. Now, by the time the protein is in the small intestine, 90% of it has been broken down into individual amino acids in order to be absorbed. Here's the thing. Your body only sees these end products. It doesn't know that these amino acids came from collagen or chicken or fish or eggs or beans or any other source of protein that you can think of. And we can make collagen in-house from the amino acids that we get from any other source of protein. Even if you did want to get your protein from collagen, that's cool, but it's not even the best quality source. The collagen in most supplements we buy is hydrolyzed collagen, meaning it has already been processed a fair amount by enzymes to be made into a purchasable product. But this also makes them even more indistinguishable from other protein sources. And although there are preliminary studies showing modest skin improvements in subjects who are supplementing with collagen, 
these studies are highly uncontrolled, meaning that it's hard to definitively say that these benefits are purely the result of collagen supplementation. The reality is the subject's skin may just be better because of the increased intake in protein, period. So just to quickly summarize, your hair, nails, skin, etc., all depend on getting enough protein. But the source definitely does not have to be collagen. And it's completely false to suggest that collagen supplements will go straight to your skin or hair or wherever. All right, moving on. Uh, this is it. Pudding has a little bit of maple syrup, so technically it's not keto, but it's pretty low carb and everything else is too. And eggs, a lot of people think they're high in cholesterol. They're not. It's actually the good cholesterol. It's good saturated fat. When you have that with low carb stuff, not like a white bread or something. Yeah, like this rose. Exactly. Then you're made in the shade. Excuse me, you don't want the crusty part on the end there. <laughs> rose only likes the prime parts here. You know you're a parent when you put the half chewed up piece of toast in your mouth. Hey, waste not, want not. But anyways, lots to say about this breakfast here. Let's first talk about the meal itself. Now to recap, Bobby and his sweet little daughter are having a two egg omelet cooked in ghee, keto toast with some almond cream cheese, pecan butter and sugar-free jam, and some low carb chocolate chia pudding on the side. I love that we've got some protein and healthy fats from the eggs and tons more of those healthy fats from the chia pudding. We've got keto toast and pecan butter. Now, obviously this breakfast is on the lower carb side, but as I always say, you know, if low carb is what feels good to Bobby, then it works for me. Having said that, I do just want to remind parents that unless it's been specifically prescribed and the clinical reasons for this are honestly few, children should not, I repeat, should not be put on a low carb diet. As for Bobby's meal, I mean, it looks great. Um, I guess my suggestion would be if you're gonna make something like an omelet, it's just a really easy way to sneak in some morning veg. So he could throw in some spinach, bell pepper, tomato, whatever he's got on hand. And as for his daughter, I would personally avoid the keto bread and give the kids some carbs. So like fruit, bread, oatmeal, etc. A growing child needs a lot of energy and carbs are a critical source. But other than that, I think the issue for me is not the meal itself, but the side of diet culture that comes with it. Let's break that down. First of all, Bobby mentions that eggs are full of good cholesterol and saturated fat, but only when you eat them in combination with low carb stuff, not white bread. That is one of the most bizarre statements I have ever heard, but it sounds really convincing when Bobby says it, right? So here's the thing. Bobby is right in saying that eggs are an awesome source of protein and fats. However, there has been a lot of controversy about eggs since the fat they contain is largely saturated and they're also a source of dietary cholesterol. As I discussed in my video on saturated fats right here, we have since seen some research suggesting that dietary cholesterol from food has very limited impacts on blood cholesterol levels that you would read in the lab. In other words, it's not likely the cholesterol that's the big problem for heart health. Furthermore, an updated 2020 meta-analysis stated that moderate consumption of eggs was not associated with heart disease and that it may actually in fact lower heart disease risk in certain populations like those of Asian descent. The current consensus is that most healthy individuals, not including those with diabetes, heart disease, or other chronic diseases, can consume about an egg per day safely, with many health professionals suggesting two to three being totally fine. But of course, this is still a little bit controversial, and as always, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse as new guidelines and evidence emerges. And you should always run this by your own healthcare provider if you're unsure. As for Bobby's egg pairing, I'm sure it comes as no shock to anyone for me to say that nothing magical happens to the fat and the cholesterol in eggs when you pair them with regular old white bread versus his special keto bread. What we do know is that a 2010 prospective study found that replacing saturated fat with high glycemic index carbs like those found in white bread was associated with a higher risk of heart disease while replacing saturated fat with lower glycemic index carbs reduced the risk. So I guess maybe his thinking is that 
by pairing the saturated fats with a lower GI carb, maybe they kind of cancel each other out. I don't know, I can't be sure. All I know is that we don't have to make nutrition so complicated. Choose a bread that is satisfying and delicious to you, enjoy your eggs and other sources of saturated fat in moderation, and move on with your life. All right, it's vitamin time. Vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D3. You've, those are a must because they're immune system boosters. Uh, you're taking what? Iron supplement from Thorn. It's called Ferrisorb and folate from Thorn because I'm trying to get pregnant. Just Additional source of uh, iron. Ancestral supplements make some um, grass-fed organ meat. Okay, this video is gonna drain me. So Bobby claims that he takes a vitamin C supplement, zinc, and a D3 supplement every day for their immune boosting effects. So much wrong with that statement. First of all, no nutrient can boost our immune system, nor we want it to because an overactive immune system is arguably more dangerous than an underactive one. Got it. Now, vitamin C is a potent antioxidant that has been proven to play a beneficial role in both the innate and adaptive immune system by means of helping the body ward off pathogens. And there is some evidence to support its use for reducing the duration and severity of the common cold, but for the general healthy population, supplementation does not help to prevent you from getting sick. It's also a water soluble vitamin, so if you're already getting enough through your diet, which I would say Bobby probably is, you basically are just gonna pee out the rest. As for zinc, Zinc deficiency is again proven to cause severe impairment of the immune system, which would definitely warrant supplementation. However, there's also research showing that excess levels of zinc in the body can also impair immune function, just as much as zinc deficiency can. And then there's vitamin D, which is another nutrient that's important for supporting the immune system. And since most people are admittedly deficient, I would say that this is one supplement that I think most people can benefit from to various degrees. None of these supplements are bad for you or are likely to cause harm. And all of them have biological benefits to supporting a healthy immune system, but they will not boost your immune system and they won't likely do much for you if you're already getting enough of them from food. Now, Bobby also mentions that his wife takes iron and folate from the brand Thorn, which I checked out, and it is a third-party tested brand. Great. However, he also suggests that people take this grass-fed organ meat supplement that he likes for extra iron. Mmm, maybe not. Now, although I do agree that both iron and folate are very important for a lot of women, this organ supplement in particular is rich in preformed vitamin A, AKA retinol, which is known to cause birth defects in moms-to-be. Now, I know that she said she's not pregnant, but they did say that they're trying, so it's not something that I would personally risk. Now, while the amount of retinol known to cause issues is quite high, the supplement that Bobby is suggesting doesn't even list the amounts of their vitamins and nutrients on the bottle. So because there's no way of knowing how much is in there, I would say stay far away. Now, before we get into lunch, I'm gonna quickly touch on Bobby's self-care routine that he details in this video. I'm not gonna watch this or go into a ton of detail because it's super lengthy and I'm also not a dermatologist. I will just say that it's very clear to me from the moralizing language this guy uses that he spends an inordinate amount of time thinking about everything that goes in or on his body. Non-toxic toothpaste. It has no toxic, harsh chemicals that are very bad for your gums. Super, super clean. And for non-toxic uh, body care, non-toxic and harsh chemical free. It must be exhausting. I mean, if we were to take a shot every single time the guy says the words clean, toxic, dirty, etc., we would be passed out before the guy starts prepping his lunch. But anyways, I will just say that not unlike the clean eating trend, the whole clean beauty movement has created a lot of mistrust in the skin and beauty industry, perpetuating the false belief that conventional or synthetic beauty products cause undue harm. But it's worth me just pointing out that just because something is all natural doesn't necessarily make it healthier or more safe. And like food, I believe that the dose makes the poison when it comes to beauty products too. Literally anything can be a hazard for you and your health. 
but it's how a substance is used that ultimately presents the risk. Anyways, let's take a look at what Bobby's having for lunch. The bun is the cauliflower thins. This is outer aisle. They're keto, they're low carb, diabetic friendly. I smear on a touch of avocado oil mayonnaise, a touch of harissa. And nothing beats the price of the organic sliced turkey from Costco. Then the Costco prosciutto de parma, like a real deal. And then we serve it with the fermented cabbage here from uh, Costco too, very gut friendly. Okay, so Bobby says he has this turkey sandwich almost every day. Uh, we've got avocado oil mayonnaise, harissa, organic sliced turkey, and prosciutto on low carb cauliflower thins with a side of fermented cabbage that he tops with avocado oil and salad dressing for some flavor. So a bit of a small, lower calorie, low carb lunch but we do have some fiber, we've got some protein, fats, and a little probiotic action from the sauerkraut, which is great. But I do find it interesting that Bobby obsesses over his clean life, but he's fine with his Costco deli meat and charcuterie, both of which contain preservatives like nitrates, which have long been shunned by the wellness community for their carcinogenic properties. I don't know. I assume Bobby doesn't know that even nitrate-free deli meats do contain nitrates and that even natural nitrates like celery salt are not necessarily thought to be any healthier than the synthetic versions. But yeah, I'm honestly just trolling the guy for his hypocrisy. I don't honestly think there's anything wrong with enjoying these foods in moderation. I'm really just bringing this up to like poke holes in his holier than thou attitude around food. But as for the meal, again, I would love to see some more carbs in this meal. If not for him, then at least for his daughter, considering that those cauliflower thins only have about five grams of carbs in two. But anyways, let's take a look at snack. We got the smoothie here. 100% plant-based, best in class ingredients. Uh, it's the Laird Superfood, plant-based uh, protein powder. It's paleo. There's no we supplement that with a few extra mushrooms. You guys know I'm really big on functional mushrooms. Second dose of collagen for the day. This time I get flavored one with um, Primal Kitchen. Laird makes daily greens powder with prebiotics and functional mushrooms. That's it. Rose, what are you doing? <laughs> Cheers, Rose. Okay, so this is a post-workout smoothie. It's got frozen banana, almond butter, plant-based protein powder, functional mushrooms powder, a daily greens powder with probiotics, and some more functional mushrooms, collagen, and almond milk. That's a lot. First of all, I love that this smoothie is generally very well balanced. And finally, we're seeing a little carb action here with the banana to complement the protein in the protein powder and collagen and the fat in the almond butter. Great. While we already went over the whole deal on collagen, it is worth a reminder that it is unnecessary when you're also getting protein from protein powder in the same drink. Just saying. Now, we've discussed mushroom-based supplements here before, but in short, the research is largely very preliminary and very mixed when it comes to supplementing with functional mushrooms. Most positive studies state that functional mushrooms may potentially serve as an adjunct for improving health and wellness, although we do still need bigger and much better research to confirm this. Also, I would say that in the context of Bobby's overall diet, I mean, the guy's getting in lots of antioxidants in his day, I would say that taking a greens powder supplement is unnecessary. I'm mainly concerned, however, about him giving the smoothie to his adorable daughter. Now, ordinarily, I am a huge proponent of family meals, and that means modeling what we eat for our kids and serving everyone the same meal. There are no adult meals and kids meals in my house, but there are some foods that children should not have, including like half of the ingredients in that shake. As we've discussed in detail in the past, supplements like the various powders that Bobby throws into his shake are highly unregulated and can be subject to contamination with heavy metals and toxins. The functional mushroom powder specifically would be a huge red flag for me because even if this product was third-party tested and safe for adults, which by the way, I couldn't find evidence of online, we don't have research on the safety of adaptogenic herbs and mushrooms in young children. 
So repeat after me, folks. Natural does not mean benign. Not to mention, despite our society's obsession with protein, toddlers' protein needs are only about 13 grams per day, with too much protein potentially putting strain on their little kidneys. Bobby Smoothie here has over 30 grams. Now, obviously I see she's just having a small portion, but still, outside of some very specific scenarios, protein supplements are not recommended or needed for kids. All right, let's move on to dinner. This chicken, if you haven't tried it yet, is a game changer. It's not just pasture raised, it's pastured, heirloom variety, slow grown chicken. Oh, I like that arugula down there, kale growing here. It's literally golden brown, crackling skin and delicious. We got the sides out here, the brothy uh, packet of grains, the salad, the beets. Rosie's already started here. Poured a glass of keto wine, no added sugar. Got some pesto Greek yogurt sauce. Cheers is right, Desi. Okay, that does look amazing. So for dinner, we've got a spatchcocked pasture-raised heirloom slow-grown chicken. That is a friggin' mouthful, which Bobby cooked with some ghee and served with ready-made quinoa and brown rice packets, a pesto Greek yogurt sauce, a green salad made with vegetables from his vertical garden, beets, and a glass of keto wine. That is the most bougie extra wellness culture menu I think I have ever described. I mean, he may have beat out Martha and that is no easy feat. And while hopefully the heirloom slow grown chicken tastes better than conventional, everyone should know that that is definitely not a legitimate regulated term. It also doesn't necessarily make it any healthier. And it's worth pointing out that for those looking for a more sustainable option, a slow grown animal does take more feed, more water, and more land per pound of meat to sustain their growth, which probably explains why these birds tend to be about three times more expensive than their conventionally grown counterparts. But if it tastes better and Bobby can afford the upsell and he isn't concerned about the sustainability piece, then cool, that is Bobby's choice. But pretentious description aside, this is probably one of the most balanced meals we've seen all day as we finally have a really good healthy dose of carbs from the quinoa and brown rice. I'm also pleasantly surprised by the convenience of his carb choice. It's just nice to see a little relatability in his day. And nutrition wise, I love that we've got protein from the chicken and Greek yogurt. We got fats from the Greek yogurt as well, some of the pesto and the ghee, and then of course, tons of beautiful vegetables in his salad. Balanced eating with a healthy side of pretension, yes, but with Bobby, I think I'll take it. However, you guys know I have to say something about the keto wine. So. I did a little quick research comparing Bobby's keto wine to an average glass of dry red wine, and surprise, surprise, there's hardly any difference. Bobby's keto wine contains 0.26 grams of carbs, 116 calories per glass, has 13.1% alcohol content, and costs $21.95 per bottle. On the other hand, an ordinary glass of dry red wine has three grams of carbs, 120 calories per glass, 13% alcohol content, and you can get plenty of good bottles for under 15 bucks. So is it really worth the extra money and effort to seek out this special keto wine? I would think that even if you are fully keto and Bobby isn't, you could find a way to work in those extra 2.5 grams of carbs if you really wanted to. Having said that, if Bobby enjoys his keto wine and he's willing to spend the extra money, then fine, like who am I? to judge, drink what you like. But I would say the world would open up a whole lot more options and varietals if he was able to let go of the stupid bullshit labels and just buy a damn normal bottle of wine at the store. Anyways, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Let's take a look at dessert. I could either get some of my absolute favorite dairy-free best-in-class ice cream. This is coconut bliss, but tonight, I'm feeling like a cereal bowl, and I don't eat many cereals at all, but this coconut flake cereal from Thrive is amazing. All it is is coconut meat, coconut water, and then starch, palm starch, not palm oil, palm starch. The macros are crazy. It's paleo keto, and it has a natural sweetness from the coconut meat, 
and because it has coconut meat, it has MCT in there. So I add a little bit of uh, almond milk to that, and that's my dessert. It's literally just dried coconut with some almond milk, and that's cool, but I wouldn't call it dessert. Now, for someone who is not even keto fully, I don't see the harm in like adding some <gasps> real whole grain cereal into the mix or at least like topping it off with some berries for some natural sweetness. I don't know, that would just be what I do. But it's also worth mentioning that Bobby seemed really excited that the cereal had coconut, so it would have MCTs or medium chain triglycerides. However, I think it's important to note that it's very unlikely you would get a meaningful amount of MCTs from a bowl of cereal, seeing as coconut is not a pure form of MCTs and only 50% of the saturated fat in coconut oil comes from MCTs as it is. But anyways, moving on, let's take a look at the stats for this day. So Bobby's total nutrition for the day clocks in at approximately 3,200 calories with 26% of his intake coming from carbs, 40% from fat and 34% from protein. And he's meeting most of his micronutrient needs. This would place him in a moderate protein, higher fat, lower carb way of eating, which definitely aligns with his trigger happy use of the word keto without actually being fully keto. Now, since he is getting an adequate amount of fuel here, I'm really not concerned with this macro split. I mean, if this way of eating feels good to Bobby, totally works for me. But he is a wee bit low in calcium, vitamin E, and most of the B vitamins, which does make sense to me since most people get most of their B vitamins from whole grains and he doesn't eat a whole lot of that. But now let's talk about what I like here. I think it's safe to say that Bobby has a very nutritious diet. There's no shortage of fiber and antioxidants in his day. And while he's often low on carbs, I appreciate that he's got a nice variety of proteins and fats represented in his diet. Being a chef and cookbook author, he's also really creative in the kitchen. I checked out his website as well, and I was really excited to see a real range and recipes for different dietary restrictions. So I think that if you were looking for some new inspiration for some healthy recipes, particularly low carb ones, as that does seem to be his forte, I think Bobby's website would be a really great place to look. Now, while I would normally take some time to share some gentle nutrition advice, I don't think that Bobby needs any more nutrition in his day. I mean, if anything, I think my guidance to him would be to actually loosen the reins a bit and to do it before his daughter is fully engrossed in this whole clean eating wellness culture that he's obviously promoting at home. I would also say that with all of the beautiful, healthy whole foods in his diet, he could also pull back quite a lot on all of the supplements that he has in almost every meal. So on that note, let's talk about Bobby's relationship with food. Because this, my friends, is when things really head south. Holy shit, there is a lot of moralizing language around food going on here. Apparently, food can't just be delicious chicken and vegetables in Bobby's world. It has to be clean, keto, paleo, organic <laughs> heirloom, slow-grown, spatchcocked chicken and vegetables spoken poetry to from his vertical garden. Again, like I said, if this is all accessible to Bobby and his attention to his food doesn't impose on or crowd into other important aspects of his life, then great. No harm, no foul. But I think it's safe to say that this wellness culture fixation is just not relatable, sustainable, or enjoyable for most people. And there's an obvious level of cultural elitism and exclusivity here that needs to be called out. I may occasionally buy some foods organic for personal reasons or potentially mention that a product is organic for informational purposes, but I would never suggest to my followers that they should exclusively eat organic when I know that there are economic barriers to eating in a way that the evidence doesn't even clearly support. I also think we hear the word clean from a lot of influencers, most of which I think just say the word to denote a product with less processing or fewer ingredients. But when Bobby says it, or when he conversely calls foods out as fake, there's a real sense of pseudoscience fear mongering going on. Shame, guilt, and fear do not make people healthy. 
In fact, we know that common signs of orthorexic tendencies include compulsive checking of ingredient lists and nutrition labels, an increase in concern about the health of ingredients, and an inability to eat anything but a narrow group of foods that are deemed healthy or pure. Obviously, I'm not able to diagnose Bobby or anyone with an eating disorder over the internet, so I absolutely am not doing that. However, a lot of his behavior does mimic that of some concerning tendencies in my books. This is particularly worrying to me as Bobby's daughter is watching and listening to his every word. His daughter is at the age where she is soaking up everything like a sponge. And we as parents, we are their primary role model for developing a healthy relationship with food. As I've discussed in my video on raising an intuitive eater right here, I am personally much more concerned with the long game of raising a competent eater than I am about the individual nutrients my kid gets at any given meal. So I would way rather my sons be exposed to a wide range of foods that are described in morally neutral terms than for them to pick up on an obvious obsession on clean, organic, pure, low sugar foods and avoiding any and all processed and convenience foods or snacks. Honestly, a child who grows up with a heavily restricted diet may eat really healthy when his or her parents are in full control of his or her meals, but children eventually grow up. They go to birthday parties, they go to school, they gain access to the alleged fake foods that have been demonized all their lives. And guess what? They go wild. So remember, foods may not be created nutritionally equal, but we can make them morally equal by neutralizing our language. And this is particularly important when we have children around. This rhetoric is echoed throughout Bobby's Instagram and YouTube channels. While there is no doubt some useful information around healthy eating and budgeting advice and cooking hacks, a lot of it is also full of baseless claims and fear-mongering titles. I mean, things like top 10 fake foods, how to reverse aging, resetting your gut, you're eating banned foods, etc. Like, that is scary And I'm not suggesting that our food system is perfect. I mean, it is far from it, but we do have food regulatory mechanisms in place to help protect the public in first world countries like the United States and Canada. And even when things do slip through the cracks, this again is one of the many reasons I advocate for a varied diet. The more variety we have in our diet, the less chance we have to consume a dangerous amount of anything, even potentially problematic. Remember, the dose makes the poison, and foods that do contain potentially problematic ingredients generally do so in amounts far lower than what would actually cause harm when eaten in normal amounts. And Bobby does seem to say that he eats pretty much the exact same thing Monday through Friday every week. So maybe just a reminder to him to also switch it up. So in conclusion, there are actually a number of things about Bobby's channel that I really enjoy. His excitement around food, his amazing culinary chops, and his disregard for calorie counting are all really positive things in my books. However, the food fear and overt fixation on every and any little ingredient is just so exhausting to watch. And while I know that Bobby is just doing what he feels is best for his daughter, I also worry about the messages that she may be picking up through this as well. So on that note, that is all that I have for today's What I Eat In A Day review. Thank you again to Ritual for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, please be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on who you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye. And for more great videos like this, check out the link right here.